Hello, hello, hello. Can you guys hear me now? Thumbs up. Those of you that are here, I can't see the rest of the group, but I'm going to need you guys that can see me. Give me a thumbs up and let me know. I like emojis too. So how's it going? How's it going? Oh, yes. I see a couple more faces. I love faces. I love thumbs. I love emojis. So my name is Darren McGraw, as Heather said in my bio. And you know what? I'm excited to be here. I wish I could be in the room with you guys. You know, it was last, it was kind of like last minute where we were going to be at because I really would love to be in Utah. But uh, eventually we'll be in the same room again. So I'm looking forward to that. But today we're here together and um, I'm going to share some of my recovery story um, and just talk about like that peer connection. And But if I could give you a little bit of the journey first, right? Before we talk about where how I got to those letters and all that, those accolades, there was a story before it. We always have a story before it. And, you know, for me on this journey, the story is probably one of the most important pieces, you know, especially in any role that we play, those of us that are as peers, people with lived experience, when we're doing this work, especially if you're talking to legislators or advocates or whoever, we can never and forget, never, never, never forget the importance of the story. You guys with me? Thumbs up. Yes, yes, yes. I'm in the right place. Man, I heard I heard the music. I, I wasn't sure if I stepped into the wrong room or not. I was like, okay, Utah, I see how y'all do it. I respect it. I respect it. Let's see if I can share my screen. Let's see if I can do that. So we're going to talk about grilled cheese and french fries. Anybody like grilled cheese? Anybody like grilled cheese? Yeah, Beth, you like grilled cheese, Beth? Jennifer, you like grilled cheese? Nicole? Fries, French fries. So we're gonna talk about grilled cheese and French fries. This is this is kind of my recovery journey. I appreciate you once again. Thank you for um, bearing with me for while I got the tech issues together. But I want before I get started, I want to ask a question. Any self sabotagers in the room? Spy show of hands. Self sabotagers. Self sabotagers. Two hands, one hand. If you go, put your virtual hand up. If you got it, virtual hands. Self sabotagers. Yes, I see people in the chat box saying that self-sabotagers appreciate it, right? I love interaction. I don't like to feel like I'm alone. I've been alone in many places. So when we're on these Zooms and we're together, especially as recovery people, I like to feel like I'm together with you guys, right? So, yep, I'm a self-sabotager. So what does that mean, right? What does that mean? That means that I am one of the people that always gets the job. I always get the job. I work hard. I get the job get the girl, the car, whatever it is, I work really hard to get it. But how long does do you guys think it takes me to mess that up? Anybody? How long, if I say it takes me forever to get it, how long does it take me to mess it up? How long does it take you to mess it up? Anybody? Second, for me, it's no time. No time. It takes no time for me to, oh yeah, I love it. Right, Pedro, five minutes, you and me. You might be a little longer than me. It take me three minutes. I can mess. I could. I could crash that whole ship, right? So right. So the self sabotage, right? Things could be going really well, and this is for me on my journey. It's when things are going well that I tend to find myself, you know, messing things up. It doesn't have to be anything. It could just be something like things could be going so well. I like, you know, like it could just be going too normal. Anybody familiar when things are just too normal? Anything ever get too normal for you? Like things are just too normal. It's kind of boring. Like, see, I was in this, that, that when I was running in the streets, that lifestyle was, um, that lifestyle was exciting and it was all kinds of chaos going, right? Right. So me, I liked chaos. I loved chaos. So, right. So I remember this particular day, which this is a very special day for me, and I'll tell you guys why. I remember May 7, 2007, I was home. I had just gotten off of work. I was the oper I was like an operations manager at Best Western. So that means I was in charge of some people. They really gave me a clipboard, and I used to walk around telling people what to do, right? I was the man, right? But, you know, that was 9 to 5. From 5 o'clock, like after five o'clock, I would come home and I would go and I would hang out in the street. You know, I would hang out and I would hang out in the street. And so this particular day, May 7, 2007, I had came home and, um, you know, my girlfriend, I was sitting, I came home and I was watching the news and, you know, watching the news, the kids were running around and I was bored and I was, I couldn't get my mind off of this half a crack joint that I had in my pocket, right? 
It was marijuana and crack cocaine. I had an intimate relationship with marijuana and crack cocaine, right? And I say intimate because all my decisions, all my decisions were made around my drug use. Can anybody relate to what I'm saying? Like everything, what, what I was going to do, what I was going to eat, how, if I was going to eat, right? Were all based around my drug use. Well, this particular day I came home and I had finished working, you know, I had this really cool job, but I couldn't get my mind off those drugs that were in my pocket. So I put my, my hoodie and my boots on and I'm about to walk out the house and my girlfriend was making grilled cheese and french fries. Hence the story, grilled cheese and french fries, right? She's making grilled cheese and french fries and she saw me with my street gear on and she knew what time it was. And she said to me, she basically begged me to stay home. She said, where are you going? I was like, you know, I got some business to tend to. I, I, I got some stuff to tend to. I, I really didn't have any business to tend to. I was just gonna go smoke crack. But you know, I was, I was making it seem like I had something super important to do. So needless to say, um, I, we got into a little argument and then I won the argument and I went down and I got in my truck. At the time I had, any car fans here? Anybody a car fan? Anybody like cars? Cars, muscle cars, right? Like, like muscle cars, like fans, cars that make a lot of noise. Beth, you look like you like cars that make a lot of noise, Beth, right? So let me tell you, I had one of those, um, I had a, a SUV uh, Durango with a two and a quarter Flowmaster exhaust system on it. It used to make a real loud rev anytime I came down the street. It sounded like uh, everybody used to think that it would have had that Hemi engine in it, right? And people would be like, hey, does it have that Hemi engine in it? And I was like, yeah, yeah, it does. But it didn't, I was lying. It didn't have a, Beth, it didn't have a Hemi in it, right? So I get in the truck and I start that up and I'm, I, I'm the car is running, I got the engine rev. And I put my favorite CD in at the time it was MOP. Not sure if anybody's familiar with MOP, but if you listen to MOP, listen, if you listen to that, I would say to throw that CD away because let me tell you, to get you arrested. So don't, don't like get that out of your play, get that off your playlist right now because that is not good music, right? For us to be listening to. So, right. So I got the music playing, I got the MOP, and I like that, that half a joint, and now I'm in my zone. You guys know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about like that quiet space, whatever it is, wherever it, your special place is. For me, that special place was in the car at that time getting high and, and, and listening to the music, right? So then I'm driving around my block because you know, uh, at back in the day, this is back in the day when gas prices was like a dollar or something. I know a lot of y'all are young on this, on this Zoom. Y'all don't remember when gas prices was like a dollar fifty. Right now it's like ten dollars a gallon. I mean, like I couldn't even ride around the block then. Um, so I'm riding around the block and I'm smoking and I'm about to throw. Once I take the last token, I'm about to flick that roach out the window. I look in the rearview mirror, and there are the police and the lights are flashing. Right now I've been here before. This is no, this is no surprise to me. I've been here. It's not my first rodeo. Right, so I pull over. And the cop walks up to my car. The music is playing. I put the window down and the crack smoke flows out the window, hits the cop in the face. Uh, yep, yeah, Beth, you know where this is going. This is not going to be good, right? So the crack smoke hits him in the face. And he looks at me and he says, you know why I pulled you over? And I said, no. He said, I pulled you over because you were on your cell phone. And see, when I'm getting high, I think I'm a lawyer. Don't judge me. Don't judge me, right? I think I'm a lawyer. So, right, I get into this legal discussion with the officer on the side of the road, and I'm telling him that I wasn't on my cell phone, and he's telling me I was. And then I said to him, the only reason you pulled me over is because I'm Black. Well, he was Black, too. So that wasn't my best argument at the time, right? That wasn't he, it did take make him think for a minute or two. It did have him think for a second. He looked at himself and he looked at me and I was like, that's the only reason you pulled me over because I'm black. And, but he was black too. So that really wasn't a solid argument. I told you I was high, right? So then he says to me, he says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Now, I don't know if anybody on this Zoom or sitting in the room has ever been on the other end of that. Don't worry about it when a police officer says, don't worry about it. 
What do you think it means when a police officer says, don't worry about it? Anybody? Chat box? Oh, let's, see what the, let's see what my friends in the chat box are saying. Yeah. When the cop says, don't worry about it, what do you guys think it means? Somebody in the chat? Uh-oh. Good to go. Yep, you're screwed. <laughs> right, right. Yep, yep. So he says, don't worry about it. He asked me for my license and registration. Right. Yep, Beth, right. Worry about it. So he says, give me your license and registration. So I went and I have my license out. I reach over to grab my registration out of the uh, club compartment. And he grabs me by the neck and he starts choking me on the side of the room. Right. And anytime I tell a story, I can always still feel his fingers in my throat. Now, mind you, before, 25 minutes before that happened, where was I? Anybody? Chat box? Where was I? Beth, where was I 25 minutes before I started getting choked on the side of the road? Home, right, Margie. Yep, you're right. Who else? Home. Anybody else? Home, home, right. Grilled cheese and french fries. Absolutely. Yep. So 25 minutes prior to that, I was home, doing good, right? I was home, I was bored, and now I'm on the side of the road getting choked by the police officer. I tell you that because I want you to understand how simple that this could change. This is why we do this work. We talk about connection. When you're making connections, you got to let people know when you're telling your story, the reason why you're telling them the story is so they understand how easily your life can change. In 25 minutes, right? I was home, I had a family, I had grilled cheese and french fries. All I had to do was stay home, but the addiction was so strong. It was so powerful that it pulled me out of the house, got me in the car, MOP, driving around. And the next thing you know, I'm being assaulted by the police, right? So as he's choking me on the side of the road, my foot hit the gas of the truck and the engine revved, right? So you can only imagine this engine starts to rev and it makes that loud roar, right? The cop lets my throat go and he looks at me. And when he looks at me, I have this bright idea. What do you guys think I did? What do you guys think I did? Oh, oh, Beth, you're a gangster, Beth. Took off. Somebody said flee, drove off. Yep, Kayla, put, put it in drive. You already know, Pedro. Right? So, yes, I put it in drive. And I took off, right? Because this guy's crazy. And I'm high. So now I'm in a police chase, right? I got about seven police cars behind me. I had a question for y'all. How much gas do you think I had in the truck when I decided to go? I told y'all I smoked crack, right? How much gas do you guys think I had in the truck when I decided to get into this police chase? Oh, one gallon. Marjorie, you balling out of control. Four gallons. Four gallons? Yes, Beth, near E. I had the kind of gas, right? that when you put your foot on the pedal, the light comes on. And when you take your foot off the pedal, the light goes off, that kind of gas in the car, right? So now I'm in trouble. I got seven police cars behind me. I'm on E and I got one window down an MOP plan. I, I got a situation, right? 30 minutes prior to that, remember where I was? I was home, right? I was home, grilled cheese and French fries, listening to the MOP. I mean, I grilled cheese and French fries watching the news, right? So. I have this bright idea. I put the car in, I, I, I have this bright idea. I say, well, you know what? The car's gonna run out of gas. Let me go home. Because if I go home, at least my girlfriend can pick me up when I get arrested. Cause you guys know I'm getting arrested, right? So see, I'm thinking, I'm on my, thinking on my feet. So I bring all the police officers to my house, to my nice quiet street. Now I got like seven police cars on my street. The lights is flashing, everything's going on. And I get out the truck and I say to the officer, what's all the commotion about? And he shoots me with the taser. Now, I don't know if anybody here has ever been tased before, but I thought I was going to die that night, right? I thought I was going to die on the, on, on, in front of my house that night. So if I'm in front of my house and I'm getting tased, and who do you think had the luxury of seeing that? Chat box? Who do you think? Family, right, Ben? Yep, 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 deal, kids, neighbors, right? Yep, yep, girlfriend, everybody, right? So they kept tasing me and tasing me and calling me a scum of the earth, right? 
And um, somebody, I never remember, I don't remember who it was, but they said, you're going to kill him. You're going to kill him. And um, they stopped and they handcuffed me and they tie, um, put these plastic strips around my legs and put me into the car and brought me to the hospital. Because when they bring you to the, they got to bring you to the hospital because when you get tased, they have to take the prongs out of your body, right? So they bring me to the hospital and I never forget laying in a hospital bed, one hand cuffed to the bed. And I'm looking around and I see two police officers, a doctor and a nurse. On the nurse's face, she had this look of disgust. And I couldn't figure out what she was looking at. And when I, when I realized she was looking at me, I was dirty, I was filthy. I was covered in ashes and burn holes. I probably didn't smell so good. Kind of like the people we come in contact with every day when we do this work in the communities and people that have been on a run. Right. And this is why it's important when we talk about connection, we talk about connecting with people. We talk about a lot of times you'll hear in organizations meeting people where they're at, but we really know what it means to meet somebody where they're at, because that's when they're at their worst at that moment. I was at my worst place. Right. I was dirty. I was in, in trouble. I was in a hospital. And this nurse, she didn't have any compassion for me. She looked at me like I was a piece of trash. And I'll never forget the look on that nurse's face. I'll never forget that. So it didn't take long. They took me out, took the prongs out of my body, and they brought me to the police station. So I get to the police station, and you know I'm sitting in the cell, and I'm trying to calculate. Once again, I'm a lawyer. I'm thinking, Oh, this can't be that bad. How bad could this be, you know, running from the police, you know? And, you know, he did choke me and they did tase me. I'm willing to forget all about that if they just let me go. Well, that wasn't their plan. They didn't have the same, they weren't, they weren't on the same page as me. Needless to say, do I look happy in that picture? No? Anybody? Do I look happy in that picture? Do I look happier today than I look in that picture? Yeah, some of y'all say, hell yeah, right? That's what, that's what, missing that grilled cheese sandwich. That was a sad day. Beth, that was a sad day. So quarter of a million dollars bond. They, they had, I was sitting in a cell. 45 minutes prior to that, I was where? Home, grilled cheese, french fries, kids and everything. Now, about an hour later, I've been choked, tased, and I'm sitting in a jail cell on a quarter of a million dollars bond. When I asked the officer why my bond was so high, he said, oh, because the officer said that you dragged him 25 feet at 20 miles an hour with your vehicle. I was like, that didn't happen. He said, I don't know what to tell you. And his dash cam wasn't working. So now... I'm sitting, based off of one decision, my friends, based off of one decision that I made, now I'm sitting in jail, quarter of a million dollars bond, because I wanted to get back to that, my drug of choice, right? You see how easily that can change? And the reason I like to tell this story is because, number one, it keeps it fresh for me, but it also lets you know how easily someone can easily be, you know, in need of services, in need of that peer connection, in need, of, in need of the work that we do, each and every one of you do in the communities that we need. We need somebody to be able to, to understand what we go through. Needless to say, I went to prison for four years, violation of probation, all for that one decision, that one night, my life changed completely. Worst day of my life. But I'll tell you, it was the last time that I was in the back of a police car. That's the last time I ever put a substance in my body. and. So to say that as of May, May 7, 2022, I just celebrated 15 years uh, without putting a substance in my body or being in a police station. Thank you so much. Honor and a privilege to be here. Thank you. And so we say that to say that this thing is possible, right? This thing is possible, but it's a journey, right? You can't do it alone. I know I couldn't do it alone. And, you know, it makes me think of when I was in that cell, that wasn't the first time. I wish I could tell you guys that that was the first time that I was in, cell, in that cell, but I had spent 10 years of my life cycling in and out of the correctional system, right? 10 years of my life cycling in and out of the correctional system. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get it right. 
I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get this thing right. And, you know, while I was in there that last time, May 7, 2007, I had an opportunity to peel the onion back. And I had an opportunity to start, you know, looking at my life and, and thinking about, like, you know, what I wanted to do. And I realized when I, I was doing some research, right? While I was in that cell, I was doing some research. And I found out that I was institutionalized. Anybody else, anybody else here institutionalized? Whether it be from prison, um, treatment facilities, any, and some of us are institutionalized even at our workplace, right? We only function well at work. So, right? So I was institutionalized with the criminal justice system. And what did that mean? That meant that I needed a structured environment in order to function. I needed a structured environment in order to function, right? And that really bothered me, right? Because when I was in the street, I'm working, but I can't get it right. Remember the self-sabotager? I couldn't figure it out. You know, I always kept finding myself in that jackpot. I couldn't, you know, I had a job, but I kept going back to the street. It kept calling me. I wanted to stop using, and I would say, I'm not going to use Friday morning. And then I would be crying, punching my steering wheel on the way on, like on autopilot to the drug dealer. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get, why I couldn't get out my own way. Anybody ever been in that place where they couldn't get out of their own way? They felt like they couldn't, they couldn't figure it out. That's where I was at. But the interesting thing is I was institutionalized, right? Because when once I get locked up, once I put those tans on, all, all everything changed. I was a model inmate. I never got in trouble. I was really respectful. I was like this complete change. So what was it about the street that I couldn't get my life together? But the second I got into an institution, an institutional setting, right? My whole demeanor and behavior changed. There's some of us who have never been to prison, but been to a lot of treatment facilities, right? And we call those guys or girls that know how to program well. Anybody in the room know how to program well? When you get to the program, right? You get to the program, all of a sudden you're like, good morning, Joe, how are you? Would you like a cup of coffee? But in the street, you're like, F you, man, don't talk to me, da 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 right? But in, in the program, you're like a model citizen, right? A model person. You ever, like, some of you guys work in, pro, in programs and work with people, and when they're inside, they're completely different. They're the nicest person you ever met. See them on the outside once they put a substance in their body, right? See them back in the, in the community. And that's the kind of, that's kind of the thing that I was struggling with. Also struggle with a little PTSD. Anybody else admit, is it only just me that was smoking crack on here? I think I'm the only drug addict in the room today. Am I the only drug addict in the room today? That's okay, right? I know I was the only one smoking crack, right? And I was the only one that, you know, was going to prison and pouring in their stuff and all that. I know, I know, I know, that's okay. So I also struggle with PTSD right? Struggle with the things that I've seen, the trauma that I experienced before I even put a substance in my body. I was experiencing trauma at six years old. See, I want you guys to understand when you're working with people and we're doing this work, and we're making this connection, we got to understand the people that we're working with and how they come to us. Because see, I had already experienced trauma before I even put a substance in my body, right? And then I just, as I grew up, I experienced more trauma, more trauma. Then you go inside the prison and guess what? You're even more traumatized. Now you got strip searches. You got all this stuff going on. Am I talking right? Give me a thumbs up. Let me know I'm in the right room. Sometimes I walk into the wrong room. Sometimes I'm talking to the wrong people. I just want to make sure I'm in the right space, right? So, you know, I was experiencing, you know, I'm traumatized before I even got into, into a cell. Then I'm re-traumatized by being in a cell. You're in a cell with another person. They make you cohabitate with this person. Strip searches and all this violence and everything that goes on inside the prison. And then guess what they do? They let you go. When your time's up, they let you go. We still ain't dealt with no trauma yet, though. We still ain't discussed this trauma yet. But they let you go. And they put you back out into the community, right? And now you're supposed to figure it out yourself, right? 
And you still can't figure out why you're still not whole. You still can't figure out what's going on. You still can't figure it out. I know that was my story. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out on my own. I couldn't figure out why I kept finding myself in these situations, like attracted, almost like a magnet to these situations, right? Some of the things that I also experienced and I've seen other people experience was antisocial personality traits. And when we do forensic training and we talk about forensic training, those of you that may join us in the forensic training as we come up or the overview training that we'll be doing, keep in touch with Heather because we'll be talking more about that. But understanding, right, how antisocial personality traits play out. Because if you're a peer and you're connecting or you're working with people and you're connecting with people, a lot of times programs will say that this person has an antisocial personality trait or and because they're not attending meetings or they're not going to groups and they're not going to this. And what happens to those individuals, they start to get labeled as what? Non-compliant, right? But see, if you've been where I've been, you've been in the places that I've been, and you've experienced the stuff that I've experienced, when you're in prison, that's not a social place. That's not the boys club. That ain't a place to make friends. So, and if you grew up in certain environments and you've been using for a long time, like I was, I didn't even know, I didn't even remember how to make friends. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes nobody ever, if you grew up in a toxic environment, a toxic home, maybe nobody ever taught you how to be a good friend. Yet, if we don't know that and no one teaches you that, and then you go to these programs and they want you to jump through all these hurdles for your freedom, how can you do that if you never learned how to, how to even function? They want people to follow, follow instructions. They want you to follow this and do that, man. If I could do all of that on my own, I wouldn't even be in, I wouldn't have the issues that I have, right? So, so that's some of the stuff that we talk about. And then really looking at like some, one of the other things that I think about is here where we talk about like the social sensory deprivation syndrome, right? And this is, this is something I know it sounds heavy, but understand those of us that have been in solitary confinement, those of us that have been locked down, you know, with very little human contact, people that have been in psychiatric wards, right? And they have this, you could have this syndrome where you don't have like a lot of human contact. The lights stay on to a certain level. So your eyes start to deteriorate. It only takes 30 days before you start to start to experience mental health symptoms, right? It only takes 30 days and for some it takes less than that. And imagine if you go into the system already with some mental health challenges and now because of those mental health challenges, you might be experiencing an episode or something. So now they put you in solitary confinement by yourself, which is probably the worst place you should be is by yourself. And you find yourself by yourself. And now you're experiencing all these different things. And guess what? When your time is up, they let you go. They don't, they don't call Nicole and say, hey, Nicole, uh, Daryl was in solitary confinement for 40 days. Make sure that you guys keep an eye on him. They just drop them off at your place. See, this is why we need to do better, my friends. This is why this, this power of connection is deeper than you ever thought. Power of connection is connecting with individuals that may be struggling. And this is why we need to make sure that we're asking the right questions. Does that make sense, my friends? Can you guys hear that sound? Thumbs up? Cool. trauma circle is everyone ready to face their past with compassion is that a yes yeah. while you were growing up during your first 18 years of life if a parent or other adult in the household often or very often would swear at you insult you put you down or humiliate you step inside the circle 
if a parent or other adult in the household often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or threw something at you, step inside the circle. If a parent or other adult in the household often or very often ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured, step inside the circle. If you often felt that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, step inside the circle. If your family lived in extreme poverty, step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Good to see you. How are you? you amen. Noel. Noel, good to see you. Honey. Welcome. I was abused as a young girl. I was beaten by my mother. I was verbally abused by my mother. I was sexually abused by another man. My father was an alcoholic. My mother was a rageaholic. I've driven drunk. I've sold drugs. I was a juvenile delinquent. Probably my story is similar to most of your stories in here. I'm white and I'm female and I didn't, nothing happened to me. So, you know, I got a get out of jail free card. And so I'm here now because I see myself in every one of you. I'm a traumatized child, raised by a traumatized child. My mother was traumatized as well as her parents. Like he said, we wasn't born in the world of being evil people. My mother didn't want me. She hid her pregnancy. She tried to flush me down the toilet. But as I learned about these things, I always asked myself what was wrong with me. When I come to the circle and I see everybody else and she's reading off the questions and people step in even further, and I look at my childhood and I'm like, a lot of these people in this yard are just like me. There was one step I should have taken that it didn't take and I saw some of my brothers and my friends take that step and I felt like such a coward you know I wasn't brave enough to be there with them when they took that step and um, every round after that I, I took the most difficult step. Our traumas kept us separated we were all on the circumference all standing apart but once we began to acknowledge our traumas publicly it brought us all closer together in prison, you're not supposed to show your weaknesses in prison, though. But to, 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 to want to do that, to walk in that circle like that, and to take each step forward was a reminder to ourselves that we still have a humanity and we worthy to be loved, though. Most people on the outside don't understand that we want to change so we can re-enter society better than what we left it. And I think one of the things that when you was yelling at no shame, and you had us yelling it out, it was freeing us too. And it was a point to where when I was looking at that and we was all looking at it, in a circle you can hear that echo, no shame. Yes. And that was very powerful, especially coming from a little lady like you. <laughs> I'm 76 years old, I've seen a lot. I don't like talking. I like to meet people that understand what's happening without words and you one of them. The day had been one of the best days I had in my whole entire life since I've been out there these 40 years. Your true spirits are not violent. Your true spirits are magnificent. Hi, my name is Fritzy Horseman, founder of the Compassion. That's why we do this work, my friends. You know, a lot of people 
go through life and we, you know, experience many different things, but the more we talk, the more we come together, the more we find out we're more alike, right? And there's a lot, right now, even though we're here, there's somebody sitting in a cell, there's somebody sitting in a treatment facility that needs you, that's going to come in contact with you, that may experience similar to what those brothers, what those brothers in the video, as many people said, there's no shame. We got to make sure that we are expressing there's no shame. There's no shame. We all experience different things. And this is what makes us human. And right, that human connection, right? We talk about the power of connection, the power of humanity, that power of connecting with human beings. There's nothing like it. There's no, there's no amount of money that could even replace the level of connection when humans connect. I'm connecting with each and every one of you right now through this video. I'm this, I'm in Connecticut. You guys are in Utah but we're still making this connection. I'm making connections with people in the room, sitting in the audience, because we all know that we've been through something. And once you've been through something, and one of the best, one of the blessings about this, this, this journey is to be able to say, I'm, in, I'm a person in recovery. I'm a person in long-term recovery, right? Because that, I don't have to tell you what I'm in recovery from. It could be drugs, it could be a health issue, it could be a relationship, it could be gambling. I don't need to know what you in recovery from. I just need to know that you're in recovery. And that means that you've been battle tested and that you've been through something. And now together, you and I are on this journey together to go and help others find that light out of the darkness. You guys with me? Thumbs up. We got. So when I when I do these talks and we start to talk, we talk about the, the pebbles and the boulders. I can't talk about this enough. I say it all the time. The boulders are the things that you see. You can see them in front of you like, oh, man, I'm not going to do that again. Oh, man, I'm not going to I'm not going to jump off that bridge. That's probably not the best move. But the pebbles are the small things when we're trying to plan that recovery journey. We're in early recovery. We're trying to help somebody figure out how to transition. And they tell you, I'm going to go to my sister's house. And they get over there and their sister's boyfriend is selling drugs or it's a toxic environment. They didn't plan for that. Right. A lot of times we have a plan. And I always say when we're on this journey, we need to have a plan A, plan B, plan C and a plan D. Right. Sometimes you might even need an E because you never know. So we got to prepare people. And when we're connected with them, we say, well, OK, so what if that doesn't work out? Nobody wants to hear that. Like, what if that doesn't work out? All right. But let's just have just let's, let's just have a backup plan. Right. Let's just have a backup plan. Right because it's important because that pebble, right? There's so many pebbles that I came in contact with when I first came home and I was on this journey of recovery that could easily slip right back into the prison system, easily slid right back into addiction. This is why we try to show people that this journey is real. And this is why you can't do it alone. You kind of need help. You kind of need help because if I slip, I want Beth to be able to pick me up and tell me I got it. Right. I need that kind of help. I need the cold on this arm. If I fall this way, you know, I'm a big dude. I know y'all can't tell, but I'm a big guy. Right. So if I fall, I may need two or three of y'all to catch me. Right. So, you know, Molly, you might have to put the baby down and catch me, man, if I'm falling. Right. So understanding that, you know, this is what we do together. This is why we stick together. This is how we make it work. And the, the pebbles and the boulders are so significant. Right. But we cannot underestimate the importance of what? Language, right? Language matters, right? Anybody, those of you that have been in those relationships, whether it's been with a parent or an abusive spouse or teacher or whoever, they use language that's degrading, right? Language is one of the most dangerous weapons, right? And, and they use them in professional settings, all frequent flyer, they call people frequent flyers, they call them addicts, and they call them this. We can no longer subscribe to those languages, my friend. If we're trying to make connections with people, if the power of connection, there's so much power behind words that we need to make sure that we're using the proper words, addressing people accordingly. I heard, I heard a story the other day from a lawyer who actually cried because she didn't, she didn't, she didn't act fast enough. She didn't intervene. But the judge kept calling the lady a baby mama, a baby mama. The judge now, oh, what's the baby mama got to say, right? You never address people like that. And here's this judge 
degrading this person. And we know people in high positions, sometimes they may be sitting high, but their, their self-esteem is so low that they need to degrade other people, right? So here's this judge calling this lady a baby mama and the lawyer, she was talking to me about it and she didn't know how to intervene. And this is where we as peers and people with lived experience can come in and teach people who have never been in these places how to talk to people, right? Because sometimes you got to teach people how to talk to people. Does that make sense, right? That's not a baby mama. That's Mrs. Brown, the mother of. That's Mrs. Brown, so-and-so. She's a mom. She's not a baby mama. We don't talk about people like that, right? That, you know, we don't, we, people, man, this is why we, I, I, I get stuck on this so much because the importance of language, man, you ever know, you say something nice to somebody, how it could change their life? You know, you ever had somebody say, man, you know what? You were the only person that was nice to me. You probably never gave them a dollar. You may not even fed them, but you said something nice to them. You were always nice to them. And it's the words, man, the most powerful thing. So we use substance misuse, substance use, persons in recovery. We always start with person first, right? We talk about people being persons, right? People, right? people in recovery, people, returning citizens, we give them the titles, the labels, those things that make that exalt them, not degrade them. And you know what? I can't, I can't speak about what other people are doing. I can only worry about what I'm doing. I can only talk about what I'm doing, right? And how I want to treat people because I want people to treat me as I want to be treated, right? Right? That makes sense. Thumbs up, right? You know, a lot of times we use the term, and we, we, those of us that are in recovery and been around a while, we use the terms dirty, right? Instead of positive or negative drug screen, dirty, man. Think about how that makes a person feel. Oh, you popped dirty today. Oh, you're dirty, right? I told you how I felt in that hospital room. I was dirty. I felt dirty, and that lady did not help my situation at all, right? I felt dirty, right? So we know how people come to us. Many times they don't come to us on top of the mountain, they come to us broken. And we gotta try to help them get to a place where they feel whole again, right? So sometimes we'll use the term of nothing, relapse, you know, return to use, reoccurrence. And don't get me wrong, sometimes when it's just us and we amongst company, we talk a certain way because we gotta reach people. But understanding that we don't allow the system to degrade our people. You don't get to say that. You don't get to talk to me like that. You don't get to talk to my people like that, right? And we talk about medication, medication assisted recovery. We hear so much, there's so much money now about MAT. You can't turn the corner without hearing about MAT, right? But we're about the medicated assisted recovery, right? You got me to stop using drugs, but you didn't ever tell me how to live. You never told me how to live while using, you never told me that. You told me, oh, yeah, I need to stop using, but you didn't tell me how to live. No one told me, no one showed me how to live in this new world of recovery. Oh, so now I'm not getting high, but I still got a criminal record. Oh, I'm not getting high, but I'm still homeless. Oh, all my friends get high, so I don't even have any friends. Remember, I got that antisocial personality trait, so I don't even know how to make friends. So you know what? Recovery can be a lonely place, my friends, if we don't teach people how to live again. This is what this connection, that connection that we're talking about, this connection, this power, is the, there is a power in that connection. And you know what? When you get good at it and you've been around a while, people could see that recovery. They could see that you have that skill set of connection just pouring out of you. So when they even see you, I have strangers come to me and say, it's something about you. You ever have somebody just say, I feel comfortable telling you stuff. They tell you stuff. Whoa, do they tell us stuff, right? They see something about us and they start opening up. You'd be like, whoa, I did not need to know all that, right? But that's part of the work. <laughs> that's, that's the rent that we're paying, right? Because people feel comfortable around us, so they start to tell us all their stuff. And then you got to go and sometimes take a shower after listening to that conversation, but that's a whole different story. Like, I don't know what happened. I was just on the bus. I was just trying to get some bread from the store, and then all of a sudden, you were in there because this is the work that we do. And you know what, it's not, for some it's a nine to five, but for me it's a 24 seven. This happens all day long, anywhere I go, I'm ready for work. I am ready for work, right? So medication assisted recovery, um, 
But if we're going to do this job, right, can I, can, can I be honest a little bit? Y'all don't mind if I be a little honest? I can be a little honest with y'all, right? See, in Connecticut, it's after five o'clock, so I'm a little bit more free speaking right now because I'm technically, it's over off the clock, if y'all will, right? So can we talk about button pushing? Can we talk a little bit? Oh, I know it's just me. Nobody else gets their buttons pushed, right? Hey, Beth, anybody push your buttons lately? You can see they think because you're in recovery, because you work at the read that the detox, because you work at the such and such, that your buttons can't get pushed. Oh no, these buttons work. These buttons work. These buttons work real well. You don't want to push every once in a while. See, my name is Daryl, but my street name and my nickname was Chip. And I used to have a mentor and I'd be like, listen, could you leave Chip at home today? Can you make sure Chip doesn't come? And every once in a while, Chip likes to show up. I don't know about y'all, but Chip likes to show up, right? So that, and if you push my buttons, I can guarantee you, I can tell you, Chip's on his way if you push my buttons on the wrong day. So we got to be conscious of that, right? And, and understand what we also bring to the table. And sometimes you might have to tell somebody, just like those of us that have children, you might like, I need a minute. I need a minute. I need a minute because Chip's knocking on the door and he's ready to show up and act out. See, Chip will get me fired, right? Chip will get me fired. So I got to always talk to Chip early in the morning. Listen, man, we can go here and we're going to do what we need to do, right? So, you know, notice what's going on in your body because you already know. What, what those are, right? Each and everybody, we're all unique and we know when our buttons are about to be pushed, right? So being conscious of that, because sometimes, you know, our people, man, <laughs> yo, our people, man, can I just say that one more time? Our people, man, you know, sometimes they can be a little, you know, but sometimes, you know what? You always, for me, I always got to remember when I was in that space. Like when I used to, when I'm in the meetings and you see the newcomer, you know, doing newcomer stuff. And then people are like, oh man, you see these newcomers, these newcomers make, man, I remember when you was a newcomer and you was out there, you know, smoking cigarettes out the can and, and doing stuff you had no business. Now all of a sudden you got a little job and a little car and they gave you one of those badges that you can hang on your neck. And now all of a sudden you don't, you all that in a bag of chips. Well, listen, I, we got to be there. We got to try to help the newcomer get their badge and get their job and get their kids back, right? We got to help the newcomer get their kids back like you did. We got to help the newcomer get that first car. We got to be there for the newcomer so we can show them, right? Not judge them. We, who, who am I? Who am I, man? If I told you about some of the stuff that I went through when I was in active addiction, I could tell you some of the stuff that I tasted off of floors, but we ain't going to go there because, you know, I can tell you some stuff, some candy canes. Christmas time is a real bad time for a person that smokes crack because everything looks like everything looks like crack. Yo, y'all not supposed to be laughing, man. That's terrible, man. But listen, right? We got to keep it real because that's how we that's how we talk amongst each other. Right. Um. That's why when I'm just going to say, in all fairness, I'm a cat lover. But when I was smoking crack, I never had cats because of the cat litter. I didn't want that all over my house. I would have went crazy. I would have lost my mind chasing cat litter all over my house. So I didn't have a cat when I was getting high. Um, plus, cats are too smart. They'll look at you like, this dude's high again. Like, the dog doesn't really care. The dog's kind of just whatever. They don't care. Just put food in their bowl. The cats are very smart. Um so, and you know, say what's going on um, for you and never blame, never blame or say it's you're triggering me. A lot of times because we, especially if those of us that are in, in these, um, yep, somebody said they're cat new. Yep, I'm telling you, cats are smart, man. Cats are, yeah, cats really know, right? Um, understanding like where you're at, like trying to be conscious of where we're at at all times when we're, when we're doing this work and you're connecting with individuals um you know not blaming saying you're triggering me or that's triggering and so on and so forth and this i also when we talk about button pushing we also talk about this at work right supervisors 
right? You ever have a bad supervisor that's a struggle and, and you're trying to, you know, make ends meet, show up for work. You might, if you got a criminal record, you're just blessed to have the job, but the, but the boss is so, so like a, maybe a micromanager or constantly picking at you. Now, I don't want to get nobody in trouble here. I don't, don't be making faces if you know your boss is watching this. Listen, this is just me talking. But understanding that we really need to be conscious of what, what's triggering to us. I know, and I'll point this out. What makes me think of this is because, you know, as I, as I mentioned, I'm a person in long-term recovery, but I'm also a survivor of the criminal justice system, right? So when I'm in a situation where a boss may be interrogating me, like asking me the same questions over and over again. For me, that's triggering. And I need to be honest about that. I don't like, even in a relationship or anybody, friendship, if somebody starts, if I start to feel like I'm being interrogated, that's not a safe space for me. And we need to be conscious of that as people who are offering or trying to connect. The best connection is understanding me. Like I need to be able to say, hey, Molly, that I'm feeling a little bit a certain type of way. You're not triggering me, but this is making me feel a certain type of way. I, and I can explain that to you because, you know, I, I'm a survivor of the criminal justice system. And the way you're questioning me about, you know, certain situations is, is not working for me or what happened. You know what I mean? And it's up, it's up to that supervisor to be savvy enough to hear you or not, but we need to be conscious of that because something as simple as that can take us out if we're not in tune with who we, where we are with our, on our recovery journey. Or, or we, you know, I always talk to people that, brothers and sisters that are coming home from prison. I'm like, you know, that CO that pissed you off today could be your boss or landlord tomorrow. So how you navigate that system today, remember it, put it in your bag of tricks because you're gonna need that for when you get out, right? Such, such a touching story, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jay. I appreciate, appreciate you, thank you. Um, where are we going, let's go, let's go. Let's talk about perception real quick. And this is all the things that when, when I was talking to Heather and Heather was talking about like this conference and, you know, working with peers, I love, 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 love. Did I tell you I love being in the room with peers? I love being in the room with peers. I love being in the room with my people. Those of you that are in recovery and those of you that are on this journey with me. The one thing that I would love to see change is because our language and our life, our, our movement is being hijacked. By, by systems, right? The system likes to use, throw the word peer around and, you know, without the proper training sometimes, right? And, and Heather will tell you, this is, my, this is my thing. We have a certain level of training that's necessary in order to do this work because we know we work with human beings that need us to be trained at a certain level. You can't just call somebody a peer because they identify as a person in recovery. You're a peer because you're trained in this work. You have been, you, you've done the work, you've done the research, right? You may be in, in the problem with, and this is where we see the word P-E-E-R, peer. That means we're alike. We, we you know, we, we're in the same club. We're in the same, right? We might've went to the same school, right? But I'm a peer, I'm a P-I-R. P-I-R is a person in recovery. See, that's a different level of peer. You can't categorize me with everybody because we're not alike. I've done some things. I've, I've, I've been to college. I've done a few things that my, my, my level of experience may be different than others, right? So you can't just put me in a box and say, oh, I'm gonna put all the people in recovery in a box. No, because we all have different skill sets. So if you wanna identify peers, we want you to start really identifying us as persons in recovery, because that means that that individual has been through something, not only have they been through something, but now they are on a path to help others get to a place of success themselves. Does that make sense to you guys? Questions, throw them in the, throw it in the, peer, in the chat box if you like. So we talked about language, but I wanna make sure that we hit this again, where we talk about self-perception, right? And in some of our programs, those of us that are 12 steppers, you go to the meeting and you'd be like, hey, my name is Daryl and I'm an addict. Like I said, in different company, we might be doing different things. A lot of us have 
grown and grown in this recovery movement. So even though we're in NA or AA or whatever A you're in, we identify as people as in recovery instead of the, the old language of addict, but some people still use that to each his own, but know the read the room, I always say. But in professional settings, I don't use the term addict. I don't use the term addict because it's degrading. And I and if I catch if if, if I was gonna say, see, it's after it's almost six o'clock. I was about to say if I catch somebody using the word addict, but I'm not gonna say I was gonna say I I try to professionally correct people when I hear them using the wrong terms, right? Um damage nobody's damaged come on man and then people use they use that word all the time because they never really been nowhere so it's easy to it's easy to judge somebody when you never walked a, a, a mile in their shoes thank you thank you damage anxious deadbeat useless selfless we got to make sure that we're using these words person in recovery hopeful helpful and i just got the i just want to point out here making sure we're using trust, right? Trust is a big trust is a big thing. It doesn't happen overnight. And a lot of us don't trust people, but once we get to a space that we can help show people, we have to be trustworthy in order to be looking for trust. Um, I wanted to tell you guys this piece right here. June 10, 2010 was when I was released from prison. So it's an honor and a privilege to be here today on June 10. When Heather told me about this conference, I was like, yes, 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 I will be there because this is a special day for me because that's when that door opened up, June 10th. And June 10th, 2015, right? This is the last, I've done a couple of talks today, but today this is my last talk and I would wanna be nowhere else in the world but with you guys today, my friends from Utah, doing this talk on June 10th. June 10th, 2015, I bought my first house. See, so that crackhead, that was in that hospital bed in 2007 is now a business owner, a homeowner, and an and honored speaker, keynote speaker today at the Utah Peer Conference. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Understanding and defining connection as energy that exists between people when they feel heard, valued. Hold on, can I say that again real quick? Pedro, give me a second, man. Let me just make sure I get these points to everybody. Define the connection as energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship, right? We need to be getting something from each other, right? It's a mutual thing. I'm gonna leave you guys with this video because it's one of my favorites. You know, if nothing else, we need to have empathy. Right? We got to have some empathy. Y'all guys know about some empathy. I know about empathy around there. In Utah, they use empathy. They got empathy down there. They got an empathy store. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb. 
but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Yeah. And last but not least, best job in the world is being a dad. You know, that's just what this lifestyle and you guys have shown me how to be better and better and better at is being a dad. And um, I want to say thank you for letting me be here. Thank you for letting me share. And uh, I'm looking forward to coming down to Utah soon.